All right. Um, today we're going to distinguish between electric interactions in two different types of materials. We're going to define and talk about conductors versus insulators. And simple definition, basic difference between the two, is that a conductor has mobile charges that are free to move. Hence the name mobile, just to drive it home. They're free to, to move throughout the material. And insulators don't. That's basically it. Insulators don't have mobile charges. So what we've been dealing with so far, the case of the tape, for example, is an insula insulator. Uh, insulators, we have charges. We have positively charged nuclei and electrons bound to those nuclei. But the key idea is that those electrons are bound to the individual nuclei and can't move, at least not very much. Okay, They can shift a little bit. The electron clouds in the atoms or molecules can shift a little bit. But they can't, they're not free to move throughout the material, okay? So when you're looking at an insulator that's polarized, so here is some block of an insulator. What's an insulator? Examples of insulators. What kind of materials are insulators? Wood, plastic, Rubber is an insulator, okay? A lot of or organic materials, right? A lot of things having like carbon, hydrocarbons in them are insulators. Um, so let's say we have a block of plastic and we bring a positive charge nearby. It's a neutral piece of plastic. And my markers are dying a little bit here, so let me grab another. And it polarizes. And the way we said we indicate the polarization is that we can think about the individual molecules actually becoming induced dipoles. Okay. And if I were to draw, in fact, this is a point charge. If I were to draw the electric field due to that point charge, it's kind of pointing away like that, right? So to make it is to give the sense that this is uh, polarization due to this electric field, I'm even drawing the di dipoles kind of lined up in the direction of the, uh, of the electric field. And if you wanted to indicate, since the field, the polarization or the, the dipole moment is proportional to the field, if the field drops off with distance, we can kind of draw a less elongated dipole farther away to indicate it's not quite as polarized. But the key idea in the way to represent this in sort of this cartoonish way uh, is that you're drawing the individual molecules and showing a polarization for each molecule or for each atom. Okay. So each individual atom becomes polarized, or it becomes an induced dipole, and so the whole material is polarized. But the atoms, or the electrons, still s stick with the nuclei. The electrons are not free to move around the entire uh, material. Okay? So that's a polarized insulator. And of course, with the tape, we saw a case of where we had excess, or net charge, on an insulator. And the key idea here is that if, you, if you're able to place a net charge or an excess charge on an insulator, excess charge tends to uh, just stay put. Okay, so let me write it that way. What do I mean by that? Well, I could 
do this. Let's say I have a uh, little piece of plastic, like Lucite or Lexan or some sort, something like that. And I'll do another contact interaction, another surface interaction, and charge up, put an excess charge on the, uh, on the piece of plastic by rubbing it with some silk. And I'll just rub one end. And it will turn out that the charge, if there's any charge at all, will just stay where I placed it, where the contact interaction occurred. It'll just stick there. It won't spread throughout the entire uh, entire material, and I can again show that if I charge this end with the same material, give it the same charge. So if I bring the two charged ends together, I should see a repulsion, maybe, and I do. Well, that's that's satisfying. So we see these two charged ends repelling. If I brought this end to that end, what should I see? Yeah, I should see an attraction, right? Now, it might be a little hard to see because this is a, there's kind of a lot of friction on this little pivot here. But if I bring a neutral end to the charged end, i got to get it close. Oh, yeah. I can, it's, starting, it's starting to go. Oh, that's pretty nice. Yeah, almost. Okay, it almost works, right? It's just a lot of friction on that pivot. If I bring the neutral end to this neutral end, I should see nothing at all. Okay. So the, and the, the key idea here is the charge stays put. It stays where I placed it. I rubbed this end. You didn't see the charge spread throughout the uh, entire object and charge up the entire, the entire rod. If you had, I would have seen a repulsion between uh, these ends, right? So insulators, the charge tends to stay put. And because of that, why does that happen? Well, because there are no mobile charges. You, place, you stick excess charge in one place. There's no mechanism by which it can move throughout the entire material. Um, you can place excess charge on the surface, which is easiest to do with these sort of surface interactions, or in the interior. Now, it's kind of difficult in practice to do, to place excess charge in the interior of an insulator. But one way I could do it, for example, is if I had one surface that I charged up, one surface of an insulator I charged up, and I just glue it to another insulator, okay, just stick them together with some, with some glue, and now I've got some excess charge in the interior, and it will just kind of happily stay there because there's no, there are no mobile charges for it to, to move around, okay? So charging in the interior is okay, charge on the surface is okay, and it just can kind of stays stays put where you where you place it. Uh, as opposed to a conductor. Give me an example of, of a conductor. Metals or conductors? Anything else? There are other Yeah, water, and particularly water with uh, ions dissolved in it, right? So aqueous solutions, let's put it, put it that way. And let's just look at an example of a conductor. Let's say we have some salt water. So here is say, a beaker of water, and I've dissolved some ions in it, so if I dissolve salt in it, the salt, the uh, ionic bond in the salt molecules breaks apart, and so you end up with positively charged sodium ions and negatively charged chloride ions, just kind of all floating free. Now, of course, this is a huge exaggeration here. But you get the idea. These, these ions are free to float about throughout the entire aqueous solution. And so they, these are the mobile charges. Okay. They're free to move about, free to float throughout the entire material. Okay. Another example is a metal. And metals are kind of special 
and they're going to be extremely important in this course. We're going to be talking about the properties of metals over and over again. Uh, in those of you who took 205M probably remember the ball and springs model of a solid where we thought about the structure, the internal structure of a solid as behaving as if it were hard spheres connected to each other by spring-like forces. Okay? And so the hard spheres essentially were the atoms and these were the interatomic bonds. Okay. And this whole this model is sometimes called the the lattice, okay, meaning the structure of the uh, of the atoms inside the material. We're going to add on to our model of metals of the internal structure structure of metals by saying not only is there the atoms and the interatomic bonds, which are essentially the inner electrons that are bound to each other. And these interatomic bonds are essentially the electrons that are bound to the atom. Okay? But metals are kind of special in that they also give up at least one electron that is free to move about the entire object. Okay, so if I have a series of atoms in a lattice in a metal, this atom gives up an electron and now it has a, a nucleus plus a smaller number of electrons. So it actually has a positive charge now. And this atom gives up an electron and this atom gives up an electron and this atom gives up an electron and this atom gives up an electron. Up an electron. Well, where do those electrons go? They go into what's called an electron C. So here is our block of metal. You can think of this as an electron C, a sort of free-floating ocean of electrons that are delocalized. They're not bound to any one particular atom. They're just kind of floating, in a sense, throughout the entire material. And they're free to move about. So you can think of the electrons almost like, like, a, uh, like a gas, where electrons are free to bounce around, jiggle around, move from one side to the other without, without anything impeding them, okay? at least as a first approximation. And we'll just kind of take this as our model of, of how things behave. For an explanation of why this is, you need uh, quantum mechanics to, to fully explain this. But one way you can picture this, and I'll show a little V Python program. So here's a model of a metal, okay, and you can see a series of positives, and those are what are called the atomic cores, or sometimes the ionic cores because they are now ions, they have a single positive charge, which consists of the nucleus plus inner bound electrons. So those atomic cores are just sitting there, but each atomic core gives up a negative charge. It gives up a, a single electron. And those negative charges are free to kind of float about. You can think of this as electron C as being able to shift one way or the other while the interior still stays neutral. Because for every ionic core, there's a electron. Okay, so you, just kind of, you can think of sort of the electrons as being superimposed over top the uh, the atomic cores, and the interior still stays neutral. But if you have a case of polarization, let's say you bring a positive charge near a conductor, near a metal. Here's a positive charge, and here's a block of metal. Well, the electric field due to this positive charge is pointing that way. So we can think of this as the applied electric field. How do I draw the polarization? Well, interior, the, in, the interior stays 
neutral, what happens is the mobile charges shift. Okay, so the electron C shifts a little bit. You can think of the applied electric field as exerting a force on the individual electrons, causing them to entire electron C to, sh to migrate from one side, migrate a little bit. So you can think of it as the electron C kind of sticks out a little bit on one side. Okay, there's a greater probability of finding electrons a little bit out of the surface, okay, in some sense. And that leads to an excess negative charge on that side. And if their electron C is, C is shifted that way, you're going to have an excess positive charge on, on that side, okay? So that's the basic idea, okay? Mobile charges inside, and this has a number of different consequences. One is... And polarization is a shifting of the mobile charges. In this case, the electron C, if you're talking about a metal. Excess charge well, think about if I tried to charge up a, a piece of metal or a conductor. If I placed any excess charge in the interior, say somehow I was able to inject some negative charge in the interior, those charges in the interior are free to move about. If I have a concentration of negative charge in the interior, what's it going to do? It's going to pull positive charges in. Well, the positive charges are the atomic cores, right? They're pretty much static because they're made up of the nuclei, and the nuclei are really heavy, and so there really isn't anywhere for them to go, or they can't be really pulled that much. Yeah, Luke. Okay, so the electrons on the outside will be repelled. So let's think of it this way. Here's an electron. It's next to a whole bunch of other electrons. It's going to experience what type of force? Can be pushed in what direction? Kind of outward, right? So that electron gets pushed outward. Here's another excess electron that's near a whole bunch of excess electrons. It gets pushed outward. So the end result is that when everything settles down, the excess charge is only going to be on the surface. So for a metal, excess charge can't be in the interior. It can only be on the surface. And even on the surface, it tends to spread out. Okay. If I tried to place, even if it were on the surface, if I tried to place some excess electrons on this piece of metal just at this location, well, again, we have the same problem, right? The electrons are going to be repelling each other. They're free to move about throughout the entire material. And so you'll see after a short amount of time, a nanosecond, a very you know, a split second, the electrons will try to spread out as much as possible over the entire surface. So you can't just place excess charge on one little patch like you could with the uh, with the insulator. It tends to spread out over the entire material. Okay.